Hello, this is Mitra and my channel Russian Photo. You can find me also at eBay, where I have the same nickname and purchase a lot of USSR photo equipment. Today I'll tell you in detail about the Nit E. It was produced in more than 8 million copies, thus making this camera the most numerous SLR in the world history. I will try to make this video so full and detailed that you will not have any vagueness or unclearness about that camera after watching it. We will speak about camera history, we will make a detailed review, say some words about accessories and lenses, find out its drawbacks and advantages and speak about its descendants and variants. So the first part of this video is devoted to the camera history. This camera was created at Krasnogorsky Mechanical Plant or KMZ, which is located in Krasnogorsk, a town in suburb to the northwest from Moscow. This factory was founded in 1942 as a factory for producing military optics, rifle, artillery scopes, lenses for aerial photography, which were vitally important during the Second World War. After end of the war, there was no need of such amount of military optics, and the plant which gained a great experience in optics production, wanted to make civil products. KMZ didn't have its own models to produce, so Fat Plant from Kharkiv gave the documentation, drafts and spare parts of Rangefinder Fat, which has been produced there since 1934 and was copy of German Laker II. KMZ started to produce this Rangefinder under the name Zorki and founded a large family of Rangefinders with its name. Only at the base of FAT four models were produced – Zorki, Zorki S, Zorki 2, Zorki 2 S, with few changes from original model. But KMZ decided to make a further step and created a single lens reflex camera or SLR. First SLR at KMZ was made in 1952 and got the name Zenit. It was based on Zorki construction. It was a real novelty for USSR market, and KMZ started to develop the construction, putting new models on sale. There are Zenit S, Zenit 3, Crystal and Zenit 3M. The last was produced up to 1970, and in fact had few changes from the first Zenit. For the late 60s it was rather archaic. It's necessary to notice that all five cameras mentioned had a unique M39 mount, which is not compatible with M39 Leica thread mount, which was used in Zorki rangefinder. They were all designed for beginners. In fact, KMZ factory had two lines of SLR, for advanced photographers and amateurs. The first professional camera was START, then the Need 4, 5, 6 family. They were very complicated, unreliable, expensive and produced in small numbers. KMZ decided to make a breakthrough in amateur cameras line and created the camera that would become a symbol of KMZ and become the most numerous SLR in the world history. Let me introduce Zenit E. In Russian it is pronounced as Zenit E. There are two versions of appearing that letter in the name of the camera. First, it was named in honor of head of KMZ Nikolai Yegorov. That's not a typical situation for the Soviet Union, where personal promoting wasn't in favor. Except airplanes, the majority of which were named in honor of their constructors, for example Suhoi, Tupolev, Yakovlev and small arms, I can name only railroad service machines named in honor of engineer Balashenka. So giving the items names of their inventors was not widespread in the Soviet Union. The other version is that KMZ wanted to underline that a new model had a built-in exposure meter, in other words a light meter. But in Russian language the word exposure meter starts from the letter E, not E. So it's a mystery. Zenit E is a film SLR. 
It's rather heavy, its weight without lens is 700 grams, but its dimensions are quite moderate. It's comfortable to hold and operate the camera. It's fully metal, with few small plastic parts. It's covered with glued leatherette. On the front we see selenium photocell window. It doesn't need any batteries for walking. It's uncoupled and is used only for defining exposure parameters, which then you must set manually. Also, it's not very precise, but nevertheless the Zenit E was the first amateur SLR in Soviet Union with this option. I'll show you later in this video how to use it. Note that it doesn't have any cover, like for example Kiev French finders. So to prevent sensitivity loss, do not leave the camera front directed to light. Then we see a self-timer setting clever and a self-timer release button. It's very simple to use. Set the exposure at the camera, cock the shutter and rotate the lever counterclockwise at 180 degrees. When you are ready, press the button. The shutter will operate in approximately 9 seconds. A flash unit connector socket is above the self-timer block. The Nit E has a cold shoe, so a flash must be connected via cable only. And finally we see the M42 thread mount for the lens. The Nit E was the first USSR camera with this mount, which became universal for the Nits for many years. It wasn't original. It was copied from German M42, also known as Pentax Universal Screw Mount. Thus, USSR and Western Optics became interchangeable. New mount allowed to create new high-speed lenses and get rid of model with two different M39 mounts in USSR. Note that a small number of first Zenit E got M39 mount, like in earlier Zenits. Such cameras are rather infrequent and can be distinguished with broader ring of the mount. We do not see any hinges for the strap and, unlike earlier and later models, Zenit E has never got it. If you need a strap, you will have to buy a case. From the rear side we see a viewfinder. Zenit E got a mirror which is always in lowered position, regardless of whether shutter is cocked or not. It's a great improvement comparing with earlier Zenits, which needed to cock the shutter for watching the viewfinder. The viewfinder itself is 20 by 28 mm, which is 65% only from the frame square. It was inherited from earlier Zenits and it's very small of course. On the other hand, the viewfinder is rather bright and much better than, for example, later Zenit 12. Focusing is very simple. Rotate the focusing ring of the lens until the image will be sharp enough at the frosted glass. Then we see a shutter cocking lever. Film transportation and shutter cocking is united in this lever. And finally, there is a cold shoe mount. Early Zenit E has it removable, later it became stationary, or it can be totally absent. From the left side there is a rear cover lock. It was also inherited from previous Zenit 3M. Unfortunately, it isn't protected from accidental opening. At the bottom there is a tripod socket thread 1 4th inch. Unfortunately, it is located at the right edge of the camera, far from the center of gravity. Early Zenit E had old 3 8 inch mount. It's interesting to notice that right position of the tripod socket that was originally introduced in Leica invariably was used in FAT, Zorki and Zenit families. It was so immutable that only Zenit 10 and 11 got additional tripod socket in center and only Zenit 12 has finally lost this uncomfortable right tripod socket. At the top there is a cold shoe, a shutter speed disk with, in fact, a poor range of possible shutter speeds, a flash type switch with MF position for single action flash bulb and X for electronic flashes, backwind button that disengages the shutter mechanism, shutter cocking lever, release button with a thread for remote cable, frame counter marked for 36 frames, exposure calculator, backwind hat, 
exposure meter window with an arrow and a ring. So let's take a photo. First of all we mount the lens. Here I have Industar 50-2, a very small and lightweight lens, which was one of two default lenses for Zenit E. Just screw it in the mount clockwise to the full. Then let's set the sensitivity of the film, in other words a film speed in the exposure calculator. Here I have a film with 100 ISO. In the exposure calculator one half, which is marked with yellow, has DIN scale or Deutsche Industrie Norman, and the other half which is marked with orange has ISO scale or International Standard Organization, the same as ASA, American Standard Association and GOST, Soviet State Standard. Both halves are firmly connected and you just need to set the film speed at any half of the calculator. DIN has possible range from 13 to 28 and ASA from 16 to 500. Probably your film speed is not marked at the scale, like in my example, there is no mark 100. So rotate the arrow to an intermediate position between 65 and 130. Then we'll load the film, we can make it at usual light. Pull the latch of the lock upwards and open the rear cover. Push the backwind head and rotate it counterclockwise a bit. It will go up and release the seat for the film cassette from the cassette's pull guide. Place the film cassette into the seat and push the backwind head, rotating it clockwise. Then the cassette is fixed firmly. Pull out a little film approximately till the take-up spool. Rotating it, find the take-up spool spring. Bend the end of the film and fix it in the take-up spool spring. Film must be strained tightly between cassette and take-up spool. If you have extra film, wind it with backwind head. Be sure that the sprocket teeth are in film perforation. Then close the rear cover. To transport non-exposed film to the film gate, cock the shutter three times, pressing the release button after each cocking. Then let's set the frame counter. Cock the shutter and rotate the disc until zero is set against the triangle. Now we must define exposure parameters, aperture meaning and shutter speed. If you are an experienced photographer or you have an external light meter, you can skip that point. So point the camera at an object being taken. If you are outside, tilt the camera a bit to the ground to neutralize the extra light from the sky. If the photo cell is working and there is enough light, an arrow in the exposure meter window will go from the right corner to some intermediate position. Rotating the exposure meter outer ring, which is with shutter speed scribes, you will move the ring inside the exposure meter window. You must cover the arrow with the ring. In this case, the scribes of the exposure time scale at the outer ring and the diaphragm scale will coincide. The scribes are allowed not to coincide within half of interval between the scribes. You will get a set of possible combinations of aperture meanings and shutter speeds suitable for specific film speed that we have set earlier. Any of that combination allows to get a normal frame. Let's choose some average pair. Aperture meaning 5.6, shutter speed is 1 125 second. Let's enter that meanings into the camera. Rotating the aperture ring at the lens, we set the diaphragm 5.6. To set the shutter speed, Pull upward the shutter speed disk and rotate it till the dot will coincide with the desired shutter speed. Then watch inside the viewfinder and focus, rotating the focus ring of the lens until the image will be sharp enough. Then 
press the release button. When you have all the frames used, controlling it with the frame counter or you just want to unload the camera, exposed film must be rewound back into the cassette. Push the backwind head and rotate it counterclockwise to pull it. To disengage the shutter, press the backwind button and hold it. Rotate the backwind head clockwise till you hear clap, meaning that the end of the film left take up spool. Open the rear cover. Pull the backwind head up and remove the film cassette. That's all. Film can be developed. Zenith E has many variations. First of all, as it was produced at two different plants, firstly at KMZ, then, because of the camera shortage and high demand, also at Belomo, it can have different logos of the factories. The logo can be not on the bottom, but for example on the rear side too. Being produced during 21 years, camera had a lot of fonts used in the name inscription on the front, both in Latin and Cyrillic. Many variants of lazarette pattern and two possible body colors – widespread silver or infrequent black. Zenith E has special commemorative versions. From the left, devoted to the 25th Congress of Communist Party in 1976, and from the right, devoted to the 60th anniversary of Great October Revolution in 1977. 22nd Summer Olympic Games in Moscow were perpetuated too. It's interesting to notice that special version had been produced before the official symbol of the Olympiad was chosen. So KMZ put the Olympic rings on the front, transliterated the word Moscow into English and produced it until the official symbol was chosen. Olympic versions were 10 Soviet rubles more expensive than ordinary ones. Zenith E was exported abroad very actively. It could save its own name or got a new one, depending on the country. In USA, Zenith E became Kalimar or Prince Flex. In Germany, Review Flex. Here is the full list of possible names. Speaking about variants, Zenith E had a modification Zenith ES with special release button at the bottom. It was used in Photo Sniper FS3 set and was based on the buttstock. Camera had one more default lens, Tire 3 FS. Zenith V was a simplified type of Zenith E without exposure meter. Note that this camera has also two possible mounts, M39 and M42. Zenith V was 10 Soviet rubles cheaper than Zenith E. Zenith V E was a laboratory version of Zenith V. It had special lenses and adapters for connecting to medical or laboratory equipment. It was used during endoscopy, photo micrograph, duplicating photo and etc. Zenith EM got a mechanism for jumping aperture. Viewfinder glass was replaced with plastic focusing screen with Fresnel lens and micro raster. Default lens was Helios 44M supporting jumping aperture mode. Zenith BM was the same as EM but without exposure meter. It's worth mentioning that Zenith E changed the color of USSR lenses. Before that camera they were not painted and had silver color. But that silver reflected the light to the exposure meter window very often, thus causing incorrect work of light meter, which showed overexposure. So since the need E, your SSR lenses became totally black. At the photo you can see silver mirror 1 of pre Zenith E era and black mirror 1 V of post Zenith E era. Zenith E could be supplied with two different default lenses. Camera with M39 mount had of course lens with this mount. They are Industar 50 or Helios 44. No doubt the latter is better, but Industar 50 is extremely small and lightweight, so it's difficult to say which lens is preferable. Zenith E with M42 mount got the same lenses with new mount. They got dash 2 to their names, indicating that they have M42 mount. It's interesting to notice that camera equipped with Helios 44-2 was much more expensive than with Industar 50-2. Lenses with M39 mount can be used on a camera with M42 mount using a very simple adapter, which is just a ring. Sometimes it's a good idea, because, for example, Helios 44 for M39 mount has a version with 13 Apache blades, 
instead of 6 in Helios 44-2 for M42 mount. Silver Mir 1 is considered to be better than black one. But note that distance scale at the lens can show untrue information when mounted on M42 mount. Soviet Union produced more than 100 lens models for M42 mount. They cover the full range of focal distances, from fish eyes to catadioptric lenses for astrophotography. If it's still not enough, website lensclub.ru knows about more than two and a half thousand models. So you can find less with any characteristics you wish for M42 mount. Note that if you use very big lenses like Mir 20M or catadioptric lenses like MTO 1000, they'll close the exposure meter window, so light meter cannot be used then. So how to choose a lens for Zenit E? It must have M42 mount, 1mm thread pitch and flange focal distance 45 and 5mm. Soviet Union produced various technical and special lenses with M42 mount, for example for enlargers. They can be mounted to Zenit E, but because of different flange focal distance they will not work. Such lenses need bellows or intermediate rings to be used at Zenit E. Unfortunately, camera doesn't support lenses with jumping aperture. And of course, only manual focus is possible. Soviet Union and countries of communist bloc produced a lot of accessories for the Nip E. I will not list all of them, just give some examples. Here you can see macro bellows made by German Pentacon. At this picture there are Soviet macro rings U, T, Z. A lot of converters were made. Here is TK2 set between Zenit E and Mir 1V lens. As it has double magnification, the characteristics of the lens are doubled. Zenit E viewfinder is very simple, so from the left you can see ND2 rubber eye cup and from the right LT, a nozzle with the optic adjustment. As for the cases, there are two possible materials, leather which is more comfortable and firm, but heavy, and leatherette, which is almost two times lighter. Cases are universal and suitable also for the need EM, ET, TTL and V models. Unfortunately, because of the tripod socket placed at the edge, but not in the center, all the cases will have a backlash from one side. As for the flash, you can use any. It must have cable connect. Do not forget to switch the flash switch type in X position. The only shutter speed for flash is 1 second. Zenit E is very easy to find. For example, at eBay it costs about 20 US dollars. This is my ad on the screen. As you can see, almost working SLR cost $20.61, including shipping. What to pay attention at when choosing? Of course, camera must be working. If you don't need bulb mode, you can be tolerate to the cameras with non-walking B mode. The same is about light meter. If you are an experienced photographer and can set the exposure instinctively or you have an external light meter, ignore the non-walking light meters. The same is about self-timer. According to my experience, comparing with other USSR cameras, a typical Zenit E is most likely walking than not walking. A very typical drawback of the Nit E is a black vertical line in the viewfinder. It doesn't go to the film, but focusing will be a bit uncomfortable. And some small advices. Cameras with Latin name on the front were designed to be exported abroad, as they have better quality. The same is applicable to special versions. And KMZ cameras are considered to be better than Bill Oma. But I repeat that having hundreds Zenit E passed through my hands I can state that the Neat E is very reliable and most likely is working. In conclusion, I'd like to say that the Neat E is a legendary camera. In fact, it's a mess of contradictions. Many features inherited from earlier cameras became its drawbacks. They are a viewfinder which is very small comparing with the frame size, closed shutter that has poor range of shutter speeds and is afraid of cold backwind with head but not with roulette, absence of hidden lock. Light meter is in fact fully manual, the measurement and entering the meanings were fully manual as we have seen. Camera doesn't have hinges, hot shoe, the tripod socket is uncomfortable, light isolation is absent 
so there are numerous light reflections inside the body. Frame counter with manual setting to zero is rather archaic. On the other hand, for 1965 Zenit E wasn't outdated. It had a built-in light meter, which sometimes can be necessary, a mirror, which is always in lowered position. Shutter speed can be changed with both cocked and released shutter. For mid-60s it were important novelties for amateur SLR. Camera is very, very reliable, it breaks very rarely and can be easily repaired. Zenit E was the cheapest Soviet SLR, only its version Zenit V was cheaper, thus being available to anyone. When exported abroad it had few competitors in price. Today it's still very cheap. M42 mount allows to use an enormous line of various lenses. Viewfinder is very bright and better than in next models like Zenit EM and TTL. Zenit E is an epoch-making, interesting, reliable and honest camera. With its innate positive and negative features it was a product of its time. It became a friend for millions of people, recording their joys, holidays and important moments. If I succeeded with this video in passing my respect to that camera, which caught my first steps, my mother holding me in far 1986, I will be happy.